The sun beats down on you as your horse trots across the wide, open plain. Muttering a curse at the heat and stifling a groan, you run your hand across your brow, mopping the sweat. All around you is nothing but open land, the occasional clump of vegetation, and the soft snorting of the horses from your company. Ahead, some way off by now, the great coffin is being towed. More of a building than a coffin, really, you think to yourself. You wouldn't have seen the Parthenon, and it's doubtful you ever will, but it might have left a similar impression on you if you had. The coffin has loomed ahead of you ever since you set off from Babylon. Who knows how long ago that was now. Since then, you've been inching back home towards Macedon, one hoofbeat at a time. It's a slow and arduous journey, with nothing like the pace and excitement of your initial journey east, but at least it means you'll get to see home again. After all, even your own family won't have known whether you were alive or dead for years. You find your mind wandering towards the late king, the figure you only ever saw on the crest of a hill, head hidden by armour, who now lies in that coffin. You don't know what he would have been like, really. He was impressive enough, but as a person? Your job never took you anywhere near him. Your only role as part of the cavalry was to ride out into battle and break his enemy line for him, which didn't involve mixing with the higher levels of society. One of your companions claims to have seen the Persian King of Kings Darius III once, but you don't believe it. You've been sent as part of this grand funeral procession, traipsing slowly back to Macedon on the orders of Perdiccas himself. Still, although it's a long journey back, at least Alexander's mortal remains will be able to rest back in the homeland of his ancestors. A shout from one of the guards tells you that someone's been spotted. You follow his gaze to the south and see a column of dust rising up from a nearby hill. You frown and tighten the reins on your horse. A relief column? That wasn't mentioned back in Babylon. As the shapes resolve into the figures of horsemen, your eyes widen in panic. These are not friendly faces sent to take over your arduous duty. These faces are contorted into determined snarls, and there are naked blades glimmering in the sunlight. A commander nearby barks an order, and the whole procession slows to a halt. Men grab their weapons and ready themselves, facing down the charging horses. Feeling the hot rush of adrenaline surge through your veins, you grab your spear and hoist your shield from your back onto your arm as the first horseman hits your forming line. In an instant, all is chaos, the world slowing down to a crawl. Your whole universe consists of the tangled rush of limbs, blades and hooves. You duck one blade and send a man flying from his horse. Another rides at you and is cut down, but they keep coming, more and more of them, an endless torrent rushing at you. You don't know how long you keep fighting but at last they retreat. For a moment you rest easy, proud in your victory. Then you see the carriage moving off to the south, moving away from you, and you realise. In that same moment, someone shouts, The body! They've taken the body! Hello everyone, and welcome to After Alexander, episode 2, My Kingdom for a Corpse. Last time, we left the tensions in the Macedonian Empire simmering away gently, with the great magnates eyeballing each other suspiciously. Today, we're going to light the match paper, put the cat among the pigeons, and watch the action begin. The bonfire does not start, however, with some grand territorial war or a coalition forming against the threat of the rising star that was Perdiccas. That might have happened at some stage anyway, but it's not what set everything into motion. No, instead, it started with Ptolemy and a body snatching. Before we go on, a bit about sources. Apart from the three main books about the Seleucid period I've been falling back on for the past few episodes, I'm going to be using a 2002 paper by A. Erskine called Life After Death, Alexandria and the Body of Alexander, as well as another one from 2018 focusing on the final act of the First War of the Successors. As usual, titles will be in the show notes. Alexander's body, rather surprisingly for a great conqueror, seems to have been neglected for a long while, 
It apparently sat completely untouched for seven days, while the men he left behind scrapped in the immediate aftermath. Even after this point, another two years passed while his hearse was being constructed. The way Erskine interprets this is that the kingdom is, to some extent, in denial when Alexander dies. Having an actual funeral for him would force everyone to accept the new reality under Alexander IV and Philip III. Whether that's true or not, it's interesting to note that during the period of the hearse's construction, coins using Alexander's likeness were still being minted. When it was eventually finished, however, the hearse was an imposing sight indeed. 64 mules carried a structure saturated with gold and columns, and an olive wreath made of gold on top which shone in the sun, perhaps looking more like a mobile temple than a coffin. The plan was that Alexander would head slowly westwards, away from Babylon and towards his final resting place. But this begs the question, where was this? There are two main theories which I've been able to dig up. The first is Ege, also known as Vergina, in Macedon. Ege, by the way, is spelt A-E-G-A-E, -E, and I'm not entirely sure how I should be pronouncing it. This location was supposedly due to Macedonian tradition. It's not for nothing, after all, that the logo which immediately appears on the Wikipedia page of Macedon at this time is called the Vergina Sun. If, in case you're interested, Vergina is roughly speaking in the middle of modern-day Greece, a hop and a skip to the west of Thessalonica. The other main candidate is the Siwa Oasis in Egypt, which Google Maps informs me is roughly 200 kilometers inland by the western border of modern Egypt and Libya. As with most of the events surrounding Alexander's death, the narrative is rather confused, and later accounts try to resolve this seeming contradiction by having the men he left in his wake arguing and divided over the location. Regardless of which is true, if either, Alexander's body was moving west. With that said, let's go back to Ptolemy. As we discussed in episode 1, Ptolemy had been a bit of a fly in Perdiccas's eye for quite some time by this point. He had replaced imperial administration with his own, and annexed a province to the west, with an eye to setting up his own kingdom rather than merely being a governor of an imperial province, subordinate to the Argead royal line of Macedon. What happened next depends on which side of the argument you were talking from. An account by Diodorus tells us that Ptolemy travelled into Syria and met the funeral procession, born out of respect to Alexander. If you believe his account, the whole process that follows seems to be rather seamless, as if Ptolemy simply took over and took the body on its, the next leg of its journey towards Egypt. The truth, however, is probably less consensual. Erskine notes that one of two things seems to have happened. Either Ptolemy seems to have somehow convinced Philip III, who was in charge of the body, to bring it to Egypt. Alternatively, he had kidnapped the body after intercepting the procession, hence my non-historical dramatisation at the start of this episode. As an aside, it seems likely that Ptolemy did something like this, seeing as we don't even know if Egypt had been the original destination, after all. Whatever did happen, Perdiccas was not happy about it. A 3rd century writer called Alien recounts that Perdiccas chased down the coffin, which, as you can imagine for a mock temple-style monolith being pulled by 64 mules, was not able to move particularly fast. However, Ptolemy took the body out of the hearse and supposedly substituted it with a dummy before heading to Egypt. Perdiccas supposedly caught up with the hearse and stopped, thinking he'd successfully recovered Alexander's remains, by the time he found out about this swap, it was too late to do anything about it. This story is likely apocryphal, given the bad light it paints Perdiccas in. Given what's about to happen, it shouldn't be too surprising that later writers are keen to portray him as the dunce being outwitted by the hero of the story, Ptolemy. However, it does serve nicely to convey one point. Perdiccas was not going to take this theft lying down, and war would be the result. However, that's going to have to wait for later on. Before we cover the First War of the Diadochoi, or the successors, we're going to take a step back and discuss why Alexander's body was so important, such a prize worth fighting over. That's part two, coming up after the interlude. See you then. <laughs>
Alexander the Great had begun to accrue something of a mythology during his life. For example, the reason why the Siwa Oasis may have been so near to his heart is that it was supposedly where the local oracle proclaimed him to be the son of Zeus Ammon, and thus a demigod. He was supposed to have received a delegation from the mythical Amazons during his conquests, and then spent an amorous two weeks with their queen. Given that he managed to completely usurp and then expand one of the largest continuous empires the world had seen up till now, in around about a decade, we can perhaps forgive people for getting a bit starry-eyed around him. This aura continued to surround him after he died. There are legends that, when people looked on the corpse after its prolonged abandonment in the hot sun of Mesopotamia, he supposedly still looked as he had when he was alive. Even the striking resemblance of his coffin to a temple should tell you all you need to know about Alexander's increasingly divine reputation. He was not seen anymore as merely human. In ancient Greek culture, the mortal remains of great heroes could become something of a good luck charm for those who had them. In the 500s BC, the bones of Orestes, the mythical son of Agamemnon, he of the Siege of Troy fame, were brought to Sparta, and it was to this that they credited their success against the Persians. A century later, the supposed bones of Theseus were brought to Athens. Given that Alexander was increasingly seen as the equal of these gi giants of mythology, it's perhaps unsurprising that this same reputation built up around him. Given this, it's perhaps unsurprising then that Ptolemy took the body. In addition to this, the other thing owning Alexander's body gave was legitimacy. People like Ptolemy were merely the generals of Alexander, with no royal blood to give them the connection they would ordinarily need when setting up a kingdom, although myths would later rise up to join these dynastic dots. The Ptolemies, for example, later began claiming that Ptolemy was not the son of a man called Largus after all, but instead a son of Philip II and half-brother of Alexander. Given that Alexander was claimed by some to be the son of Nectanebo II, the last native pharaoh of Egypt, this connection might well give Ptolemy the legitimacy he would have needed in the eyes of his Egyptian subjects. As an aside here, the Seleucids had one of these connections as well, but we'll get to that in time. Added to this, possession of Alexander's body also strengthened Ptolemy's position militarily. At this time, there were a lot of now unemployed Macedonian soldiers wandering around with nothing to do. The fact that Ptolemy held such a major chip meant that these men streamed into his camp, many of whom would probably have fought with Alexander. All of these factors meant that Ptolemy was made stronger and Perdiccas was made weaker by the snatching of Alexander's body. The weakening of Perdiccas's position was something that he could ill afford, given that his power rested on the flimsiest of bases, namely the possession of the Argiad royal family. With all that in mind, it seems inevitable that Perdiccas would muster an army and invade Egypt to get it back. So, what eventually happened to the body? Alexander was first kept at Memphis, before being moved to Alexandria after the city was largely finished. His burial place, later known as the Soma, was within the area that had been reserved as the royal quarter from the very beginning. As time went on, it became tradition for Ptolemaic kings to also be buried in the Soma, so much so that the legacy of the Ptolemies became indistinguishable in Alexandria from that of the Great One. Alexander became more and more of a legendary founder figure as time wore on, somebody in the vein of Theseus. In fact, it was not until Ptolemaic Egypt was conquered by the Romans in 30 BCE that Alexander's legacy began to separate again from the Ptolemies, but we will cover all of that in time. For now, we're going to circle back around and discuss Perdiccas' invasion of Egypt. That will be in part three, coming up after the music. See you then. As I just mentioned, the theft of Alexander's corpse was the straw that broke the camel's back for Perdiccas. He gathered an army and set off for Egypt. Now, we haven't mentioned Seleucus in a while, but we know that he came along on this expedition, leading the famed companion cavalry of the Macedonian army. I know you might now be expecting a dramatic showdown between the forces of Ptolemy and Perdiccas, the deciding moment in the fate of an empire. However, the reality is rather more anticlimactic. 
because Perdiccas got bogged down before he even got into Egypt. Specifically, his attempts to cross the Nile River in order to face Ptolemy ended in disaster. Time and again, Perdiccas would try to cross the Nile, and time and again he would fail. The tipping point came when one crossing saw him leaving half his forces stranded on an island in the middle of the river. The riverbed crumbled away under their feet, sweeping the stranded soldiers away and leaving them prey for the crocodiles or liable to drown. This was a rather significant problem for Perdiccas, given the importance that Macedonian tradition tied to kings and rivers. Rivers were seen as divine beings which could offer and withdraw favour to an individual. For example, an ancient king of Macedon, Perdiccas I, the youngest of three brothers, was supposed to have been given divine backing by a river he and his brothers crossed. As a result, it was him the Macedonian kings claimed descent from rather than his brothers. Crossings were highly ritualised affairs, during which the leader of the crossing, the king, was seen as being connected to the divinity behind the river, acting as a ferryman to the men trying to cross. If a crossing failed, it could be extrapolated to mean the greater conquest surrounding it was not sanctioned. For example, even Alexander the Great seems to have taken bad omens surrounding a river into account when he finally turned back from his conquests. Now, consider Perdiccas's position. Although Perdiccas was not the king, this was essentially an all but name, so he had a lot to lose from these abortive crossing attempts. After all, he held almost all the cards. It is speculated that had he married Cleopatra, Alexander's sister, and buried Alexander at the royal tombs of Vergina, he might well have been received as king in Macedon proper. As such, his Alexander-style attempt to cross the Nile would have been seen as a test of his legitimacy. Rituals are not mentioned during the crossing, but by devising the strategy they were going to use, Perdiccas was shouldering the, pos the responsibility, and thus also the blame and lack of legitimacy or divine favour when it went wrong. In addition, the mythology of the previous king, Perdiccas I, was well known to the men, so a direct comparison would be possible between these two Perdiccases with their different results. The disaster may have changed the minds of some to see Perdiccas as an imposter trying to ride the wave of Alexander's glory. Finally, it seems, some of his officers had enough. The evening after this particularly unsuccessful attempt, three officers crept into his tent. Two of them, Python and Antigenes, are not that significant to our story, but the third was Seleucus. In the dead of night, Perdiccas was stabbed to death in his tent by his once loyal subordinates. When the sun rose the next morning, Ptolemy was welcomed into Perdiccas's camp. History, sadly, doesn't record what his reaction was to this particularly unexpected twist. The generals who now remained following the assassination of Perdiccas met at a city called Triparadisus. Ptolemy was offered the regency of the empire during this meeting. Now, it's worth noting that this may have been because he was in possession of the body of Alexander. In the eyes of many, the body, the two kings, and the regency of the empire would have all gone hand in hand, again showing how valuable the body could be as a piece. However, Ptolemy turned the regency down, no doubt thinking that secure control over Egypt was a more profitable career move than flying too close to the sun by accepting. Instead, Antipater, the man Alexander had left behind in Macedon when he set off for Persia, was appointed as the new regent. Seleucus, meanwhile, was made satrap, or governor, of the province of Babylon, he may have made Antipater more amenable to this arrangement by proving valuable to him. Shortly after Perdiccas's death, the army began to grumble about not having been paid, which Seleucus and another general called Antigonus dealt with. Keep that name in mind, by the way. Antigonus is going to come up again in our story. Now, Babylon was at the heart of the empire and the second richest province after Egypt. However, the native population were prone to rebellion, and it was surrounded by other satraps eager to make their slice of the pie a little bit bigger. In fact, even before he was officially installed as governor, Seleucus had to fight a pitched battle in order to see off Docimos, the governor that Perdiccas had appointed when he was still in charge of the empire. However, after this battle, Seleucus was comfortably ensconced in the satrapy. Perdiccas's death hadn't solved the empire's problems. If anything, it might have made them worse. Antipater, now 80 years old, didn't have the strength of character to eject Ptolemy from Egypt after the settlement. In addition, there was now a divide between supporters of Perdiccas and those who were not. Some of Perdiccas's supporters were still holed up in Anatolia, led by Eumenes, the former secretary of Alexander, 
Seleucus may have chosen Babylon for himself after deciding that a united empire under Antipater was not the way forward. Instead, like Ptolemy, he seems to have decided that controlling his own province was a smart career choice. And if you were going to rule a satrapy, you could do far worse than Babylon. All of this strife with Perdiccas had also narrowed down the number of generals who were left standing. Of course, there were Ptolemy, Antigonus, Seleucus and Eumenes, but also Python, one of the other knife wielders in Egypt, and a man called Pukastas in the city of Persis. Eumenes, a wily and gifted man, was now an outlaw, due to his support of Perdiccas, so the gloves were off as far as he was concerned. Add to all of this the fact that Antipater was entering his ninth decade of life, and you get a general picture of an empire that has got no further away from the knife's edge with the current events, but is in fact moving ever closer. Whatever you might think of Perdiccas, he arguably had the firm nature that might have kept the empire together. And now, the substantially more feeble 80-year-old Antipater was in charge of a bunch of squabbling generals who were beginning to notice that looking out for their own is rapidly becoming a more sustainable option than staying together under one empire. That's where we're going to leave it for now, with Antipater just having acceded to power. Next time, we'll see Antipater off fairly rapidly, and watch another wheel begin to go flying from the wagon of the Macedonian Empire. In the meantime, feel free to get in touch at afteralexpod at gmail.com for any questions or comments. Until next time, have a great week.